everyone. We're just waiting for some more people to come in. <clears throat> okay, we're already at 30 participants. I think there's one or two more coming in, so we'll just wait another minute. <clears throat> Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for attending uh, this seminar organized by the German Fundraising Association and the King Baudouin Foundation in the US. My name is Martin Georgi. I'm the chair of the German Fundraising Association. And I'm here together with managing director of the German Association, Larissa Probst, as well as some other board members in the background. So I've got to be careful what I say. Um, first, I would like to say two words in German. Ich begrüße alle Teilnehmer hier auch ganz herzlich zu dem Seminar. Das Seminar wird auf Englisch stattfinden. Das heißt, wenn jemand Probleme hat mit dem Englischen, kann er oder sie sich gerne per Chat bei mir melden. Ich würde dann versuchen, eine entsprechende Erklärung hinzuzufügen oder gegebenenfalls auch den Telefonkontakt aufnehmen. Also erste Hilfe ist jederzeit möglich. Und am Schluss, wenn jemand Fragen stellen möchte auf Deutsch, kann das gerne auf Deutsch geschehen. Wir würden die Frage dann auf Englisch übersetzen. So that was just some comments to the German participants that we will be holding the seminar in English, but that questions and so on later on in German are quite welcome. And anyone who has problems with the English will be able to ask questions in the chat. So thank you for participating, as I said, and I'm glad that so many people have signed up and have decided to participate in this event. For me, it's rather a personal thing to do this today because I grew up in the United States and I got my first trainings in fundraising there. And I've lived for many years in Brussels, so I'm also quite aware of the King Wood Wong Foundation, although I must say I had to learn here that King Wood Wong Foundation is not just a Belgian entity, but they also have a wonderful US office. So that was great to meet the people from the US as well. So from that personal note, I would also like to say that I've always, always been interested in international fundraising and cross-border fundraising. So I think the topic today is quite important and relevant for us in, in Germany. On the one hand, I think there are technical things we can learn in terms of techniques, methods, and ways to go about fundraising. There's always things to learn from others and particularly from the United States. But there's also a question of sources because I think in Germany, we're not quite used to asking for money across borders, um, not even in the, EU, let, in the EU, let alone in the US. And I think today we can learn that many US sources, whether this be donors, large donors or foundations or others are quite used to donating internationally. Although having heard many of the wordings of the most recent president of the United States, we might be surprised that there's an international outlook in the US, but I'm happy to say that that is only a part of the political scene which has taken in a nationalistic tone. And overall, in my experience, US fundraising and also US politics has had quite an international outlook and hopefully we'll have that again soon. So I think um, today we can learn quite a lot. Uh, we can maybe leave a bit of our provincial windows and just looking at Germany behind and looking at some opportunities, possibilities and so on from the US. We've had, we have a high class speaker today with us who will be introduced to you in a minute. I'm really looking forward to the session. I hope you all enjoy it and please pose your questions and follow ups as needed. Um, I hope this is a start of a new type of relationship and I look forward to being part of it. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Martin, for that introduction. Hello and welcome. I'm Elena Fotinatos, the Deputy Director of the King Baudouin Foundation in the United States. It's great to be here and thanks so much for taking the time today. There are some familiar names in the attendee list, but for those who aren't familiar with KBFUS, please allow me a brief word. The King Baudouin Foundation United States facilitates thoughtful, effective giving to Europe and Africa. We enable U.S. donors to support their favorite causes overseas. We also provide European and African nonprofits with cost-effective solutions to raise funds in the U.S. through a tool we call an American Friends Fund. We have over 450 American Friends Funds, including with institutions like the Bavarian State Opera, Documenta, Fondazione La Biennale di Venezia, 
the Pinacoteca de Brera, and the National Library of France, among others. These funds save nonprofits the trouble and expense of setting up their own U.S. public charity. KBF U.S. handles all back office administration, including tax receipts and donor support. In addition to these services, every spring we conduct a study visit where we welcome 40 professional fundraisers from the cultural and educational sectors in Europe to join us in New York to learn about the American model of fundraising. <laughs> this program features high-level speakers that touch on the big picture of fundraising, but also the practical day-to-day -day matters that leave our European colleagues with new ideas and a fresh perspective. Unfortunately, the circumstances have changed our programming this year, but we sincerely hope that we can welcome our German friends to this event once again soon. If you're interested in learning more, please do reach out to me directly. My contact information will be made available following the webinar. Now, just a couple of items to remind our audience. You're all in listen-only mode. The session is being recorded, and we will address questions at specific points in the discussion, but you can submit your questions in German or in English through the Q&A feature um, at the bottom of your, of your Zoom screen. Now, without further ado, please let me introduce our first wonderful speaker, Ms. Karen Brooks Hopkins. Karen is the President Emerita of the Brooklyn Academy of Music. She was president from 1999 to 2015. She has an extensive background in the arts and cultural sector, including chair of the Cultural Institutions Group, member of the Mayor's Cultural Affairs Advisory Commission, and member of the boards of NYC and Company, the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership, and the Global Cultural Districts Network. She also serves on the boards of the Jerome L. Green Foundation, the Trust for Governors Island, and Alexander Anassas Foundation, where she is currently serving as senior advisor. She's the author of the widely read book, Successful Fundraising for Arts and Cultural Organizations, and she's been awarded honorary designations for her international work in the arts, including the Chevalier de l'Ordre des Arts de Lettres by the Republic of France, um, the Commander of the Royal Order of the Polar Star from Sweden, and the King Olaf Medal from Norway. Thank you so much, Karen, for joining us today. You really are a wonderful uh, addition to this program, and I think our participants will be so excited to hear about uh, your experience. So without further ado, Karen. Thanks so much. I'm happy to greet all of you this morning from New York. I realize it is um, evening in other parts of the world, um, but here I am at my office at Rockefeller Center uh, for the Onassis Foundation um, and very pleased to see you all and only wish that I was greeting you in person. I'm delighted to be talking to you today about the American model of fundraising. I'm going to offer you an overview of the process embedded in an annual campaign which many of you are already familiar with, followed by an example that I believe will illustrate a successful strategy. In many ways, we know that fundraising is difficult, often disappointing work. It is not for those who are thin-skinned or easily discouraged. There is, however, a silver lining for what I refer to as the golden thread that fundraising in the United States can provide and be a glue or bond that connects institutions to their public in a deep and profound way. So please follow the logic with me. Organizations, particularly in the arts, find that their support comes from three places. One, audiences who love their work. Two, the people associated with communities where they are located, like residents and businesses who believe that these organizations improve their neighborhoods. And three, visitors who see these organizations, festivals, and communities as worthy destinations. To gain and renew support from these groups of constituents year after year, we must continue to excite these donors, be the very best we can be, as well as provide these donor groups with excellent services and programs. And this is the way that we connect. By being the best we can be, fundraising forces us to do that in order to receive the support we need. So with this in mind, the table is now set for the best fundraising results and effective alignment between the right project and the right prospect. The first questions we ask are, who do we raise money from and what is it for? As we look to the who, let's begin with the Board of Trustees. 
In the world of arts administration in America, there is no more important leadership group than the Board of Trustees. They are generally the largest contributors, both financially and with their expertise. They are also ambassadors of your organization to the world. They set policy at the highest level and build long-term viability for the future of the institution. In the United States, we see board members coming from three groups. Those who have a business reason for supporting an organization, such as having their company headquarters nearby. Then there are those who love the work. For example, many board members came to my organization, BAM, because they love the Next Wave Festival or BAM Opera or one of our programs. And then there are those who feel that board service is the very best way to enhance the community in which they live. Regarding fundraising goals for the board, we set an annual contribution goal and each employee of our development department is assigned to a specific board member to help them achieve their goals, arrange their tickets and generally keep them involved. We learned that it was much easier to work with members by generating a tightly defined annual plan rather than having open-ended calls for help and money. Therefore, our development team devised a strategy for each trustee at the beginning of the fiscal year and worked with them all year long to achieve it. Now, before we get to the issue of securing financial support for your, from your board, the first question is, of course, recruitment. How do we find and cultivate board members? This is an issue of research, but also keep a good eye on lower level donors who increase their support over time, signaling growing interest. Of course, the audience is the obvious place where board members will ultimately come from. Another crucial strategy is for existing board members to invite friends and colleagues to get involved. This type of cultivation is the most common sense effective plan for building board membership. For example, we had an outstanding board member who would host fabulous dinners for close friends and colleagues after shows that had a celebrity cast. We had to deliver the celebrities to the dinners and he delivered the prospects. We identified great new board members and raised a lot of money from everyone who participated. At the end of each season, we would meet with our board leadership and our governance committee to review each member's performance. This is evaluating their fundraising. Uh, did they come to board meetings? Did they come to committee meetings? How were they involved in the institution? This evaluation is critical in terms of laying out an agenda for working with your members for the next year. Now, let's look beyond the board. Who else do we raise money from? The next are foundations. They deal with big issues and mostly they are trying to save the world. They often fund large initiatives with multi-year grants that require well-prepared, in-depth proposals. Foundation fundraising can be a long game. Then there is corporations. There are corporations and small businesses who see supporting not-for-profit organizations as an opportunity to improve their image. They want and need specific recognition. So when dealing with them, think about this phrase, credit is easy, money is hard, find ways to give them credit. <clears throat> the next are high net worth individuals and smaller family foundations. These donors are your people who will often be great board members. They don't have guidelines and sometimes they're also trying to save the world but it's their money and they can do what they want. So be tuned in to what their interests are. And take note, 80% of all gifts usually come from 20% of donors, many in the high net worth category. It doesn't get more important than this. Then there are lower level members. These are the people who live in your neighborhood, believe in your programs keep them close and move them up the food chain, building a lifetime giving relationship with the potential for a legacy or bequest gift. These are the kinds of gifts that build great institutions over the long term. 
<clears throat> then there are galas and special events. These are great for winning friends and new donors. Yes, we know the seating and the menus can be real misery, but great honorees and glorious events build your institution's legend. <clears throat> for example, uh, let's look at the 100th anniversary of the opening of the Brooklyn Bridge. Bam uh, uh, invited a fabulous event on a New York City tugboat offered by a board member who was in the tugboat business. Our guests, including Caroline Kennedy and other New York luminaries, were pretty impressed when the tug elbowed out all of the nearby yachts, giving us the best spot on the river to enjoy the show. That was a night to remember. Then there are government, city, state, and federal sources. Europeans know this area way better than Americans, so you completely understand that you must work closely with elected and appointed officials who have the power and can deliver the money. Then there are just other ideas, <clears throat> art auctions, raffles, and all manner of crazy but legal schemes. Be creative. This is where new ideas are born. In a campaign that activates each of these constituents, you must always add new prospects and pay very close attention to your projections. As a critical and helpful tool for success, I am providing a prospect chart that will show you how to compute these uh, projections. And this will be shared with you after the session. Knowing your prospect pool, you must then consider the best approach for each one of them. Options for support are numerous, including <clears throat> general operations. This is the hardest money to get, but also the most essential. It helps you cover things like salaries, the electric bill, maintenance, et cetera. It's not sexy to donors, but it is most desirable for organizations. Then there is project support. This offers the strongest appeal for donors and it is tied to programs and new initiatives which interact with them. If general operating support is the body, then projects are the beating heart of your institution. As the chairwoman of a major American museum recently said, and I quote, the majority of donors would rather give to high profile projects and initiatives. If fundraising for salaries was easy, then more not-for-profits would pay better wages, end of quote. But you can simul smartly deploy some portion of these project contributions to cover administrative costs related to your project budget, allowing you to have your general operating cake and eat it too. In terms of support, fundraisers creatively develop packages to share with donors. For example, you raise money for BAM the institution, then for the Next Wave Festival, or all education program, or the opera program, or the spring season, or all international programs, or all Brooklyn programs, or all opera house programs, or all dance programs, or all theater programs. And then you break it down once again to focus on raising money for individual shows or components of shows like costumes, sets, the opening night party, the idea here is to take the same initiative and keep breaking it down over and over and over again in different ways to align the right prospect with the right project. It's like peeling an onion, identifying each level that can be supported. Next is capital support. This is the funding that gets buildings built, galleries constructed, and keeps your place looking good and working well for the public. These are generally big projects. Funds usually come from government and high net worth individuals. Then there are cash reserves. Ideally, cash reserves should equal about 8 to 10% of your annual operating budget. This is kept in reserve to cover the lean times and give you the capacity to borrow from yourself while paying no interest. Reserves allow you to invest in a special unplanned project or address a problem. The trick here is to pay it back if you tap into it. Board members and foundations will be the general constituents that are interested in supporting cash research. And then finally, endowment. This is the holy grail of fundraising. It generates longevity and passive income. Don't take this on until you are ready. 
You invest these funds, they earn more, and you live forever. High net worth donors are the high are the heart of an endowment effort. Think universities and hospitals. And a good target here uh, for launching an endowment effort is to try and raise double your annual operating budget. Invade the principal at your peril, and this great source of ongoing disability, uh, stability will disappear. Now, with all this in mind, it's time to put this information into act. Find your prospects and secure the gifts. To have a really successful process, you must then plan next steps. Next step, important step, is research. When you buy a house, it's all about location, location, location. Fundraising is all about research, research, research. A solid research profile will tell you who the prospect is, how to approach, and any history with your organization. Also, what else does he or she support and at what level? What is his net worth? Most importantly, how will you get to him? I have included a sample research profile also in the material I am sending. Next, of course, is the meeting. This is the best situation when you can get a face-to-face -face, or in this case, a Zoom-to-face. But how? The research will tell you. Find the personal connection. Is it a board member, another funder, a loyal subscriber, your sister, whoever it is, try and get the meeting. Attend the meeting, take the right people, but not everyone you know. Be prepared, make your case and leave. Don't waste their time, but don't leave without lining up the next step. As a follow-up, send a thank you that restates the next step just to lock it in. Follow directions. If you say you're sending a proposal in three weeks, then do it. Write well. Donors have to read a lot of boring stuff. Be concise, smart, efficient, and grammatically correct. Try to paint an exciting picture of your work and your project, but don't overdo it. Keep it real. Wait a week, check in, make sure they have everything they need then to act on your proposal. Then record keeping. You've simply got to keep track of everything. The internet was made for this. Records must be accurate, clear, and up to date. For example, did your prospect attend a show after you submitted your proposal? Did someone greet them when they arrived? Pay attention to these records. If you have not heard a decision, check the timetable for closure. If you should have heard something, check in. But do it politely and don't cross the line into nagging. Fundraising is about patience and delayed gratification. And return regularly to those projections. Keep them up to date. Fundraising is a practical business. It's not about trying hard. It's just about raising money, pure and simple. It's very easy to be rejected, so you must be diligent, punctual, and not make mistakes. And of course, remember, bold, visionary programs always win the day. They build your brand, attract a new audience, and bring the money. Sometimes it's just as simple as grouping a few things together, packaging it with great design, and marketing ideas as a unit with a strong message. The great ideas bring the big donations. Before closing, I want to share an example that exemplifies many of the principles I have described above, centered on a single donor who ended up giving millions to our institution um, and to many institutions, cementing his legacy to the arts and to BAM. As an introduction to the story, let me tell you this. For my entire career, the secret behind my approach was always the reading, obsessively reading different papers, reports, and documents. No matter how hard a day I had, I ended each night reading everything I could get my hands on that revealed who was making or losing money, who was connected, who wasn't. This daily reading, I believe, gave me a competitive edge. This time it was a story in the Chronicle of Philanthropy about significant high net worth donors who were under the radar. The story mentioned a global fertilizer and petroleum products firm known as Transammonia that turned out to be the most successful privately owned company in New York at the time. 
What really jumped out to me was the name of the foundation's founder, the name of the company's founder, Ronald P. Stanton, a familiar name from BAM's daily contribution list of donors, which I read religiously. He had given $300 to BAM and with his recent small contribution was receiving patron tickets to an upcoming show. To my amazement, the same Ronald Stanton was recognized in the Chronicle as a serious art collector who had given $100 million to Yeshiva University, the largest single gift at that time ever given in support of Jewish education in the United States. The next morning, after I read Chronicle, put it together with the idea that Stanton had given Bam um, $300, I invited him to a dance performance and a pre-show supper and miraculously came. Naturally, I made sure he was seated next to me. I found him fascinating, a self-made man in every way. He told me that he had spent time in Paris with his first wife in the 1980s and at the Opera Comique, Ron Stanton saw a production that changed his life. As he recounted discovering this performance and how much it moved him, it dawned on me that he was describing Maestro William Christie's production of Lully's Artiste, the French Baroque opera that Harvey Lichtenstein, Bam's former president and my mentor, had brought to Brooklyn in 1989 to launch the Bam Opera Program. Of course, Mr. Stanton loved it the way Harvey loved it, passionate. Immediately, I saw how we could connect Mr. Stanton with the thing he valued and loved the most. I invited him to lunch after the performance and I learned more about his story. As a young man, he had served in the U.S. Army and then worked for an international ore and fertilizer corporation before he left to start his own business, Transimonia, which made him his fortune. Over his life, he amassed an astonishing arch collection, which included works by Picasso and Wire and Matisse. And though he wasn't religious, he supported yeshiva because he cared about Jewish survival. Above all, he marched to the beat of his own drum. Mr. Satin liked what we, what we were doing. He wasn't into the avant-garde, but he believed in what Bam was trying to accomplish. And at the end of our first lunch, he gave me a check for a substantial amount. And we continued to build the link from there. As I got to know him better, the subject of that tease came up again and again. In partnership with our executive producer, a great idea emerged. We decided to ask Maestro Christie if he was interested in launching a revival of that tease. And he was wildly enthusiastic. So I called Ron Stanton and I said, Ron, we have an opportunity to recreate Atis, but everything needs to be remade from scratch. The rest of it is gone. Hearing that Ron was still interested after I told him that nothing remained from the original production, I asked him, do you want me to find other money for it or do you want to do it yourself? And he said, well, what do you think? And I said, you can't ask me that. Of course, I'm a fundraiser. I want you to do the whole thing yourself. Why? Because you can afford it and we'll have a great time and it'll save me two years of running around having to do the other fundraising. We can get started right away. Without hesitating, he said, I'll do it. And that was how we brought Atis back into existence. The show premiered in Versailles and that is where it had been originally performed in 1682 and where Harvey had seen it before bringing it to BAM. As part of the Stanton revival, we took a group of donors uh, to Paris to see it in Versailles. And uh, then it toured uh, to the, uh, past the Opera Comique to Normandy and uh, to uh, several other places before it made its way to New York. Ron Stanton was so proud. He came to every performance and his contribution was not lost on the company Les Arts they took it upon themselves to convince the French government to bequeath a Chevalier des Arts et des Lettres award upon Ron, which we, he wore on the left lapel of his suit from that day forward. Now, the beauty of fundraising is that for art and life, sometimes it just comes together like a hand in a glove. At the end of the first performance in Versailles, where Louis XIV had watched this opera so many years ago, the cast took their bows. And then Maestro Christie stepped forward and stretched his arm out to Ron Stanton. Then the entire audience turned 
and applauded him for giving us this gift of beautiful music. Of all the things funded that Ron funded, I think the revival of Atis was the most gratifying for him. It was one of his great moments as a philanthropist. It was, in fact, the perfect project for the perfect donor. When he died in 2016 at the age of 88, the end of this story is that he left BAM a substantial bequest in his will. So as we wrap up, let's remember our campaign breakdown. Remember how we move forward um, with these long-term relationships. And to conclude, I would just say, bravo, you've gotten a grant. Share the good news with your board and colleagues. Getting funding is both a personal and institutional success, so be sure to spread the love. Thank your donors, have a glass of wine, go to sleep, get up the next day and do it again. Remember sometimes you have to take no for an answer, but only for a while. And when it makes sense, try and try again. Remember I said fundraising is about delayed gratification. Regarding follow-up, be sure to communicate. Don't just take the money and run. Stay in regular touch, build a relationship. The best donors feel an ongoing sense of ownership with, my, with your organization. And that brings one renewal after the next, and the next, and the next. Remember, my final point is that with fundraising, with all of its challenges, it has a creative energy running through every part of, part of it. Sometimes success can take years, but if you stay the course, if your program is strong, if you employ good common sense and good manners and follow commitment and discipline, you will be rewarded. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, we do have some questions coming in, so I'll just jump right to them. Uh, the first question is, how would you recommend to build a relationship with donors or patrons from another part of the world? Um, you need probably to have some kind of a connection there. Um, you need introduction. You need a board member who is placed in the world. That's extremely helpful. Um, if not, you need friends and colleagues who can introduce you to the funding community and who can host events for you. For example, uh, I've done a lot of work with the dance company Batsheva based in Tel Aviv. They have friends and an audience and colleagues in the United States. And every time they come to New York to perform, uh, there are a number of events and galas and so forth uh, that are uh, hosted on their behalf. And in this way, they maintain close touch with their donors. Their executive director comes to New York at least twice a year for fundraising purposes. So you need to build a support mechanism, even if you start small and build it up from there. Wonderful. And Martin has another question to pose from our audience. You're on mute, Martin. Sorry. Yes, there was a follow-up question on this We're related to more specific uh, needs. If someone has a very special need and perhaps from a small charity, the, the types of um, things you were mentioning were perhaps related to more high profile or uh, larger activities. If you're a small charity, does it make any sense to try to go to the US market with a specialized regional or other activity? Presumably you would need to find someone who has a special interest in that specific region or that specific subject. Yes, you would. I mean, the thing about fundraising is you don't want to waste time on the money you can't get or the money exactly. you can't to get. Start with the money you can get. If, for example, years ago, I did a fundraising talk for people in Santa Cruz, California, and they wanted to talk about corporate fundraising. I said, why are we talking about corporate fundraising? Because at that time, there were no corporations based in Santa Cruz, California. I said, put that aside. Deal with the lower hanging fruit. There are wealthy people here. Let's talk about a campaign where the center of it is, is based in high net worth donors. Uh, that is the best place to start. So you really want to think about the money you can get rather than just the money you want. Mm -hmm. it's a very practical business. Thank you. We have another question um, coming in, which is, I'm an American fundraiser working in Germany, and I agree that the research is key to successful fundraising program. However, I find this much harder to do in Germany where most donors prefer to remain anonymous. Any tips? Tough question. Well, 
a lot of ways to do this. There are, um, I mean, I had a research uh, guy at BAM who could find out anything about anyone. I mean, it was amazing. But generally, it's probably easier to find out about uh, your prospects. Um, it's probably easier than you think. And um, while I don't have a list with me right now, there are certain database and website materials um, that you uh, can get access to. Uh, there are wealth screens that you can run on various people. There's all kinds of information that's available that can help you compile a profile. I mean, and obviously you just do the best you can, even starting with what shows did they come to? What other organizations do they support? What boards do they serve on? Um, you know, there are many different ways to do this, um, but uh, I would recommend looking at these database, uh, these various databases. And then the other thing is, um, check out if there's a foundation center library um, in your area or region, or even make contact with the one in the United States. They have all kinds of information and material that you can have access to um, that will provide this kind of information for you that is already compiled, particularly in the uh, family foundation and larger foundation area. So I would look at those things to get started. I had That's a great another... tip with the foundation center. And I think a lot of folks uh, are surprised that, uh, that they can search a database like that for, for, I think it's a modest fee. You can search it for free for 24 hours and then a few hundred dollars for a month. And, you know, and they also- Martin, I did- let me just say one more Sorry? thing. They have collections and libraries around them. Mm -hmm. So if someone wants to actually go there and dig in and do some research, um, once we're not locked down, uh, it's another thing I recommend. This way, I, I actually think everyone should do that if you do have access to a collection. This way you can familiarize yourself with the materials, you can speak to the librarians, you can get deeper into it and understand what you need to do in order to be able to conduct this kind of research successfully. Yes, there had been an additional right. request that you had made um, a, a reference to um, a, a chairperson who had made a comment, I think it was about credit and money that was not well understood, if you could maybe repeat that for us. Um, and then the second question I would have uh, would be related to large donors and a certain risk management, because as uh, we were um, informed, for example, the Sackler family, which gave a lot of money to lots of cultural institutions in the United States and was one of the big donors, um, they were very much tied up with some negative pharmaceutical experiences and uh, several institutions um, decided to give back the money. So how are you dealing with vetting and possible building of reserves to have to, if you have to pay back money to a major donor? So those two questions, please. Okay, so on the first one, what I said is credit is easy, money is hard. Right. Someone gives you money, good manners, common sense, say thank you, put them on your mailing list, send them a thank you note, invite them to performances, bring them into the life of the organization. But also, as part of your negotiation, once you've gotten a grant, you want to find out how they wish to be credited and you know what's important to them. Some people like to remain under the radar, mm -hmm. on their name big, they want it all over the place. Um, corporations are particularly um, focused on this. So you want to build a credit package. Now, you don't want to cross over the line, um, but you do want to try to give people what they want. It's an easy thing to do. Be creative and thoughtful and get a sense of what they want and then discuss it with your team to figure out how far you can go. On the second question, look, you, so we never see these controversies coming except when we know that they're controversial to begin with. This comes back to the research. Um, if you do research and realize that you're dealing here, I mean, for years, my main sponsor uh, at BAM for the Next Wave Festival was Philip Morris. Now, I knew that I was in a very controversial situation, taking money uh, from a cigarette company. And we spent quite a bit of time discussing it with them in terms of how to best position it, how to best position it with ourselves, and then I took a lot of, um, you know, there was some very difficult uh, uh, responses. Some artists didn't want to play at BAM because of that situation. Uh, you know, there were different things that we had to do to withstand the controversy. The world has gotten more complicated since then. And I would say that um, you have to be very careful about these things when you know them. 
when you don't know them uh, and things just happen, then you try to react in a thoughtful way. This is where your board and your closest advisors um, and you know can come together with you to try and make the best decision. Is this something that's going to disappear in a few days or is it something that you really have to deal with, uh, such as the uh, pharmaceutical situation with um, Purdue? Well, thank you so much. Karen, I know there were a couple other questions that we'll address after the session today, um, but on behalf of everybody, a big thank you uh, so much for sharing your experience. I know that it's uh, refreshing to hear a different point of view sometimes from, from a different part of the world. So thank you so much, Karen. We'll be jumping off of the call, um, and it's my pleasure to now introduce our second speaker. Bye, Karen. Thank you so much once again. Our second speaker, Carla Hirsch, um, who will be popping up on your screen in a moment. Carla is the head of development at the Bavarian State Opera, serving as the li liaison between private donors, corporate sponsors, and the opera since 2017. She initially joined the team in 2015 as the events manager, and she studied English and French literature in Edinburgh and Augsburg. In addition to her work at the opera, she teaches a seminar about audience development at the University of Music and Performing Arts in Munich. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Carla as our next speaker. You are on mute. There you go. Hi, thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Good. Um, yeah. I'm just going to share my presentation um, quickly. Hang on. Um, so. All right. So what I'm going to tell you today is a little bit, ha we, what we did basically in Munich a few years ago, we, we um, started an international friends circle with the help of Elena at the King Boudouin Foundation in the US. And so I would like to tell you a little bit about our fundraising situation in Munich and then also how we started the circle and um, what exactly we did in order to um, attract donors. If you have any questions and you don't want to wait in, until the end, which is totally fine, just give me a sign or just ask the question in between. If it's something that's specifically um, about something in the presentation, that's completely okay. Right, so this is just to give you an idea of Munich. So um, we have, uh, we've been quite lucky to have a steady um, kind of growing, uh, growing income by donations. Um, we make about 5% uh, of our annual budget is, um, is covered by donations by um, corporate donations and private donors. Um, the overall budget is about 100 million. So the 100% um, of the 100%, 5% comes from us. And then about 30% is made by the house um, with ticket sales and everything. And the rest is covered by the state. Um, I think this is a situation that a lot of my colleagues in Germany are familiar with that we're very lucky right now uh, still at this point we hope it continues like this that we are funded by public uh, money but in germany i think the donations and and fundraising is becoming more and more important especially when it comes to special projects um, special niche projects that you would like to make um, happen or if you're a smaller festival or smaller house i think you can really move something with donations and when i talk about fundraising i don't just mean money i also we also have a large um, portion of um, donations in kind they're in black they look a bit smaller but you know you can i think i'm always whenever i talk about this because the bavarian state opera is a very big house and i know that a lot of um you know our colleagues in germany represent smaller houses or smaller festivals um, and it seems a little daunting to to transfer everything we do onto them. So I think the most interesting thing in this case is to look at how um, you could make it work for your um, institution, how you could make it work for your festival. And I think especially with festivals, donations and kinds are something that should really be considered and really be thought about because you can save a lot of money and you can actually make some really cool corporations that way. But um, I wanna talk about, how does it, yes, I wanna talk about um the international friend circle this is um uh, what i wanted to show you basically the important thing about this is the circle memberships because this is our private donors so when i started um in 2017 as the um, department head it was a, a kind of a goal of us was to enlarge um, the private donations because um we had 
a good amount of corporate donations and we um, we were really interested in, in, in finding more private donors to kind of deepen that relationship also because at that point that was something that you know we had people in the department who were very good at that so we decided to kind of focus on that I have to say in retrospect now we didn't know it then but now with the COVID um, crisis we have realized that this is the, the large base of private donors has been what saved us because the private donors are bound to the house in a much in a different way from corporations they, there are no contracts these are donations they are, they become partners of the opera because they love the music and they love the house and so in this crisis what happened is that a lot of our private donors actually came and decided to give us additional donations and to really support the house when you have a lot of corporate um, partnerships that's great um, it's just it's a different it's a different kind of cooperation because there is a contract and there is always um you know there is budgets and um, corporations of course they want to see what you can do for them and now you know i mean um we've all been closed for months so there's not really much you can you can really offer them apart from of course digital formats but we've learned that our private base has been much more loyal and much more um much more supportive um, simply because there's an emotional bond. And this is actually also relevant for the American donors. So this is not just something that the German donors do, but all our international donors has, have also been incredibly supportive. So basically what happened in 2017, um, and this is why we decided to do it, one of our donors in 2016, sorry, in 2016, one of our existing donors, who's a French man who lives in, has been living in New York for through 30 years, he approached us, he was a donor in a small circle, I think our smallest circle, and he approached us and he asked if we wouldn't want to think about an international circle. And back then, obviously, the first impulse was that it's crazy because why would anyone in the US give money to a house in Munich? And so we decided to, to make an experiment. So my boss basically said, you have one year to fix it. And if you can have it, if you have it in one year, then we'll continue to do the project. So basically that's how we started it. We thought, we, did, we had no idea how it would, how it would turn out. So um, Olivier, our donor, he got in touch with the King Baudouin in New York. This is, that was the first step to, real, to figure out what's a legal framework to, um, to collect donations abroad. Because obviously we from Munich, we can't give them um, what they need for the tax. And that's of course a huge motivation for donors that they can, um, they can make their donation tax exempt. And so um, we got in touch with, um, with the King Baudouin. Um, and basically what they did is they provided us with the entire framework. So it's, it's, a very, it's a very comfortable, to put it that way. It's a very comfortable way of doing it because basically you don't have, really don't have to do anything when it comes to the admin you know, back office stuff. So there was another option, I think, Elena, correct me if I'm wrong, there is, the, uh, there is an option to become a, a found or like become a charitable institution in the US, a 503CC um, structure. 501C3. Sorry, yeah, 501C3. Um, but that means you need a lot of turnover. So when you collect donations, you need to make a lot of money in order to make it work. So with the King Baudouin, it really helped us to not have to have a, a kind of financial aim you know you can start very low and then kind of build it up so this is the first question we asked ourselves so what what's the legal framework we kind of that went really quickly but then of course you have the legal framework but they're very far away and you don't really I, I didn't know anyone in the US that would give me money you know I had no personal connections to or, you know kind of networks that I could I could tap into and this is where our donor came in really handy so I think if if you want to draw uh advice from this or tips um, I think the first thing really is you need one person it's just one person is enough but you need one person who provides you with a, even if it's a small network and provides you also with the logistics because we decided what we want to do is a kickoff event in New York in order to um, I'm, I think I have this yeah we, we decided to have a kickoff event in New York to invite prospective donors and bring the Bavarian State Opera to New York. So organizing an event in New York for me in Munich 
you're so far away. You don't know, have to rely on people there. You have to find the right people there. And he really helped us. He's a he's an art curator, so he got in touch with an art gallery that we ended up working with, and we were allowed to do our event there. And then basically, what we did, we took our general manager and um, this German singer Günther, I think Austrian actually, uh, singer Günther Groisberg to New York, and we did like a small event with a small concert, and we told them about the opera. Um, what we did in in terms of um, guests, basically pretty much what we do here too. We tapped into our ticket database. I think this is the first step for any fundraiser anywhere. Um, you look at your audience. So that's what we did. We invited all the ticket buyers that had ever bought, bought tickets to the festival um, or any time during the year. And then we invited those people and also um, a, the friends of our, our donor who helped us. And this is how we started basically. So we had very, very, we had like 15 members of 10 to 15 members after this. And um, we did also kind of create a board, although I know that this is not a very German notion and we don't really have it in Munich. Um, for this circle, we have a kind of board. Basically we have three founding members um, who also agreed to um, kind of look for new members for us. It's a very kind of, I would say washed down version of the American board. So we're not like Karen just told us about the board members who are super active and they really kind of tap into their networks and bring new donors. With the international friends, it's a little like, it's a little softer, you know, the, we call them the board and they kind of feel like a board, but it's not like we don't try to push them too much because it really was just to get us starting. Um, and then the third thing we asked ourselves is what can we offer these people because of course um um they're not they don't live in munich so you know we have to give them something for their money and so what we did very early on we decided to um to focus on the festival we have a, a opera festival in munich in july um, the open festspiele and um, the good thing about the way, the, the way it's structured is that every day we play a different piece. So it's not like during the season where we play repertoire, we have two or three pieces that kind of interchange and after two weeks you have a new cycle. During the festival, we play nearly every piece that we've played throughout the season. So it's a much tighter and much um, more concise uh, schedule. And it allows people, even when they're only there for a week or two, it allows them to, to see a vast range of pieces. So we decided that we want to kind of concentrate on the, on the festival. And then also we clustered all the events that we offer them around that. So there's an International Friends Weekend and we, um, we communicate the weekend super early. We communicate it normally in September. So people can book their flights and book their hotels. And they can have, you know, kind of special rates because they book in advance. And also they can book the tickets. So they have the security that when they come to Munich to see Jonas Kaufmann in whatever Tosca, they will actually get the ticket and they don't have to stand in line and then come to Munich for nothing because, you know, sometimes the tickets are sold out. So it wouldn't make any sense for them. So this was a kind of big selling point for the program that it really allows them to structure their season and with a secure, with a sense of security. Um, right. I wanted to say some, oh yeah, I wanted to tell you another example of, um, how we then expanded, but also with the help of a donor. So basically we decided um, once the American structure was fairly strong and fairly stable, we decided to um, expand to Europe. And we worked with um, the, oh, what are they called? I think transnational giving in, in Berlin. It's, it's a very similar um, structure. And they, um, they ask all the countries that you want to um, collect donations from if they would cooperate with Munich as a charitable institution. And we decided to have a second kickoff event um, that was actually last year in Paris. And it was a very similar thing. We um, found someone who, who was really convinced of the idea of the International Friends. He's, he's a board member himself at the festival in Aix-en-Provence. And he offered to us that um, we can use his house as an event venue to have a small concert. And that was awesome because we had, again, Paris, I mean, it's closer than New York, obviously, but also I have no experience whatsoever in organizing events in Paris. So he had a, a big house very, very centrally and he allowed us to use it and to um, invite 
the same again, we invited ticket buyers from France and, um, and some people from the network. And we did exactly the same thing. We took a young singer and our general manager, we traveled to Paris, we introduced the opera and the program. And, and also again, we found some new donors there. We have a con, uh, cooperation with the Fondation de France in Paris, and they've been helping us for quite some time um, with uh, acquiring donations from France. And so this is how it kind of grows. We did another event in Russia. Um, we don't have a structure there. That was a really just an invitation from a donor from Russia who wanted us to do something similar. We went to her house and had a concert. And it, that has not been as successful as France and the UK uh, and the US. Um, and then in addition, we have people who come on their own. Um, so to give you some numbers, uh, I think we started out at about 50,000 and um, in our best year, which was not this year, of course, um, unfortunately, um, it was last year. Um, I think at the height of it, we had about 130,000, 140,000 euros that were made with the international friends. So it's, it's, it's in a substantial sum that we can, can generate. And because in a way, because it's so concentrated, they all come in one or two or three weeks during the festival. It's also a very nice way of interacting with them because they're all here at once. And then you have a very intense um, time with them. You see a lot of your international donors, you spend a lot of time with them and it's super, super intense and a lot of work if you like, but then it's kind of for the rest of the year, it's mostly telephone and email contact and a lot of kind of staying in touch and asking how they are but it's not, um, you don't have to have that extreme level of, of looking after them all the time. Maybe just uh, because it's quite interesting, I think I found it quite interesting as a German fundraising, there is a, definitely a difference between the relationship you have, or not the relationship is a wrong word because you have a good relationship, but the, the, with all of your donors, the level of intensity maybe, American donors, they become, they become very attached. So I think they're also used to, um, to being in touch with, their, with the institution a lot and to be, look after, look, to be looked after. And they're really interested in what you do and they get very, it's, it's really nice because they're very kind of, um, how do you say? Oh, I, I'm looking for the word. They're very informal. It's, very, it's a very kind of, um, you know, a very close relationship. So it's nice. I think you have to get used to it as a German fundraiser because, um, you know, it's very bit, little bit different with the Germans. They take a little more time to kind of warm up to you. But, um, but it's been really, it's been really, really nice and really um, um, re got rewarding, I think is the right word. Let me just check if I have no, I think I'm done um, with the presentation. I would like to, I haven't looked at the time, but I think there have been time questions popping up all the time. I can see them here in the little thing. So maybe we can start with some questions if you like. That was super, yeah, I mean, um, like super concise and everything, but I think people might have quite a few questions. So I think it's good to, to focus on them. Sure, Martin, do you wanna cherry pick them out or Carla, I'm happy to lob a few at you oh wait like. can i see them yes you can i can see them all right um, no i can't sorry sure 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 maybe as a starting point uh to just follow up a little bit on the last thing that you said and then martin will have more questions from a german perspective but Maybe you can talk a little bit further about the cultural differences between focusing on the US and, and your German audience, just to conclude that thought. You mean the difference between German donors and, and American donors? Yeah, but specifically in your messaging and um, anything that's an actual output of, of your efforts. Um, well, I think, um, well, first of all, I think you have to be really what, something that Karen said when she talked, she said, you know, kind of be diligent in your follow up and and kind of stay in touch. I think if you 
have a large uh, donor base abroad, then staying in touch is even more important because they don't have the kind of the satisfaction of coming to your house every night. So basically your product that you, you do sell your, your German donors, they come and see it every night. So they're constantly reminded of, of you know, what they're giving money for and what they're invested in. Um, and the American donors and, or the international donors, wherever they are from, they, um, they don't really have that privilege because they're far away. So on the one hand, they, they kind of, they know they're coming for the festival and they're really looking forward to it. So it's good to remind them, but it's also, I think really important to, to stay in touch with them closely because for them also, you're the connection point to the house. So there's a much more um, emotional, personal relationship to the fundraising manager then maybe um, with some of our don German donors who really do give money to the house and they're principally interested in the opera, I feel, and this is my subjective impression, I don't know if it's, you know, you can apply it to everyone, but I feel like the, um, the international donors, they're also linked very personally to their fundraising manager. So it really makes sense to, to kind of think also in terms of who looks after them. Um, if you have a team with more fundraisers, then, um, I mean, we are, we are five and most of the bulk of the international donors is, is looked after by me, but we have a few that um, just kind of clicked with my colleague and then she's the one now looking after them because um, it's really important that you kind of keep that constant bridge between the Germany or our, your institution and them who are so far away. So I think that's definitely quite important. Although I would have to say that that kind of finding the right um, fundraising manager for the right donor. I think that's something that it just applies to German donors just as much we do it with our donors as well. It just, it's not just the international donors. I think it's always worth thinking about who fits best to which donor. So we, we do kind of divide our donors between us in a way and, and kind of the ones who have the best relationships to them, keep looking after them. I'd maybe like to follow up on that uh, on some uh, previous questions uh, related to the fact of who's actually uh, making the links uh, to the donors because uh, you had um, given this example of giving circles, which I think is uh, quite uh, fascinating because in fact it does create a certain sub community a small community of people who are related to each other and to the institution, but how to manage these, these um, giving circles or also these um, you mentioned creating, you know, mini boards which are responsible for a certain part of the activity. Now, obviously, that cannot all be managed by the fundraising managers, and particularly for a small association which does not have a lot of fundraising yeah. staff. What um, what kind of tools or what kind of ways of working have you found to be able to work with, say, a group in the U.S. which wants to support you, but where you perhaps don't have the time to fly over all the time and meet them in person. Plus there might be language problems uh, if you're not dealing with English or not good in English yeah. or you. Um, well, actually um, we don't really, I mean, I know what you mean, yeah, the, the board I, meant, I, I mentioned, but it's, it's not really, it, the, the group doesn't really act on its own. So I think maybe that was a bit, I was a bit um, misunderstandable. Yeah. Um, well, at this point, we all do it ourselves and we don't fly over to the US, that's true. We can't afford to um, in terms of time and money. And um, basically what happens is we wait until the people come to us. So um, even if somebody becomes a new donor and can't come to Munich immediately, we basically just we meet them when they come to Munich. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, we really, to be honest, we do everything ourselves um, simply because I feel like if, 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 if a structure becomes too independent, then it's really difficult to kind of keep them, um, keep them identified with the house, you know. So um, we try to really kind of stay very, very, in very close contact with all our donors. If you have, if you have a structure where you have a board that kind of operates independently of your institution, then I think you still need a person in your team who's kind of the liaison between that structure and your house in order to kind of channel all the energies. I don't know if I answered your questions question properly. I hope I did. Um, oh. <laughs> but the, the answer, the real, the straight answer to your question is that we all, we, our entire team looks after all the donors. And to be frank, I mean, some donors need more looking after than others. I think that's definitely some, an experience that everyone made. Um, not every donor needs the same amount of energy. 
that's quite true. And um, my experience has been that small donors sometimes take more attention than that's the big true. donors. Absolutely. So uh, it's inversely proportionate sometimes to the amount yeah. that they give. Uh, one question uh, related to the, to the giving uh, model, have you worked with ambassadors? Right, yeah, I, I, I think I put it in the, in the slide, sorry. Yeah, I forgot to talk about that. Um, we don't normally work with ambassadors. Um, we have uh, two exceptions. That's one exception is a very old one. That's our campus program. Campus is our youth, children and youth program. And that has uh, used to, it, Jonas Kaufmann became the ambassador, I think 10, 20, 12, sorry, 10, 12 years ago. He's not really actively anymore. We used to have him more actively ambassador. For the international friends, we decided to have an ambassador structure um, which is something we don't normally do um, because it was advised by the donor who helped us um, make this structure. And he very rightly said that for uh, an international circle that nobody knows anything about, it really wouldn't hurt to have an ambassador so that you have one more marketing tool to make it, um, to make it more interesting maybe for international donors. So we asked Gunter Groisberg if he would like to be our ambassador. For that um, for that international circle and he agreed and so it was great to, to be able to take him to the US and, and have it like a little in additional thing that made it easier for people to latch onto it we don't normally do it to be honest so this was the only this was the only occasion where we really consciously work with an ambassador and when you bring someone from Germany do you let them speak in English even if their English is bad or do you work with a translator no we always let them speak in English Okay. I think we. I'm German. You know, if I make mistakes. But what what, what about when you when you go to France? Anyone. When no, you go everyone. to France or to Spain, what do you do there? We do speak. We did English. We did English in France as well. So we don't. Okay. I mean, we didn't go to France and, and force Mr. Bachner to speak French. I mean, he could have, but and um, we did it in English. But the thing is also, I think it's more charming. Um, you know, if 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 people, they, no one expects anyone to be perfect in English. I think, and and if I if I. Tr uh, turn it around I think if they came to Germany and made an effort to speak German I would be really impressed so um, I think you'll be fine English is fine we did that in Russia in Russia as well I mean Russia is more difficult because not everyone speaks English in Russia but it was okay as well we did it in English and everyone was okay <laughs> Now, now, a lot of what you were saying was related, um, I feel, to individual donors. Um, could you say anything yeah. else maybe about um, grants, foundations, or uh, such types of fundraising? Because that's, of course, a different reality than, uh, than the individuals. To, yeah. Have, to be have you had any frank, success there? Yeah, we haven't really tried. <laughs> um, we, we, ne we never really went into the direction of... of um, but foundation is different. We have some down foundations in, in abroad that, that um, we work with. Um, but to be frank, these foundations mostly came through our network. Um, this is one of the things we've done in the, in the past few years that we've, we've activated our network much more. I think this is something that we might have um, overseen in the, for some time. And we realized a few years ago how, how valuable our network is. And so what we've done um, is that we, we've kind of started to acquire new sponsors, sponsors mostly through our existing network and really kind of encourage people to help us to get new donors. When it comes to corporate, especially internationally, we haven't done anything um, because I think it's difficult to offer um, a valuable contract to a company that is located abroad because in the end, what we can offer them is always in Munich. So it would only make sense for a company that has a branch in Munich and then it's not international anymore. Then it's a company that's based in Munich. So what we did do when we went to um, the US for the first time um, to introduce to international friends, we, no, sorry, um, that was a year after. A year after we, um, we launched the International Friends Circle in, in New York, we went back for a tour and we took our orchestra and we played a concertante version of the Rosenkavalier at Carnegie Hall and we also because we were in New York obviously we, we um, organized some events for the international friends because we were on their turf and then we also did a cooperation with, with BMW in New York um, with a huge event for their clients and 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 um, employees um, but I have to say BMW is one of our biggest donors here 
So it wasn't some cold thing that we just did. You know, we asked them here and they gave us the contact. And then because BMW is so important for the Munich Opera, they also agreed to do something in New York with us. So, you know, it wasn't like, a, I can't really speak of any um, kind of wild um, acquisition <laughs> events, I'm sorry. Would, would you say, did. I mean, this may be also a question feeding back to the Carbon, um, to the Baudouin Foundation as well, and to, to give back the questions uh, to you, I, I would just like to have a last question. Is there a certain minimum you would say? I mean, when you have three or four friends, is it worth setting up a giving circle or, do, uh, or, or no, a national circle? Or have you, you, you mentioned for the King Baudouin Foundation also this American Friends Circles. Is there a certain minimum that you say that you have to have five or 10 or 15 or 20 donors be do before you do all the work or do you start even when you have one or two and then just build from there yeah i think um i think it depends on your institution um i mean for us just to give you a number the uh, we have two levels of of donations in the circle in the international circles one is five thousand and the other one is ten thousand so if you have three people who give you each five thousand that's fifteen thousand dollars and that I think, you know, that's good, <laughs> even if you are, even for us, that's good. And we're big, um, big institutions. So I think, especially if you're a smaller institution and maybe you don't say 5,000, maybe you say 3,000, but still, I think, yeah, I think you should definitely go for it and um, try because I think what you shouldn't underestimate, and I did in the beginning, so I did certainly underestimate it because I had, I had no idea about American fundraising, but um, people talk a lot and once this thing started the first year it was literally just this guy's friends and then suddenly people started calling me and saying oh my friend barbara told me when i met her at the met that she's in this thing and we love going to munich and we've been there every year for the last 20 so um now we have we have sponsors now who come like from japan and who got in touch with us themselves but also a lot of people who have friends who are in the international friend circle that i had no idea about so a lot of it is really something that kind of grows on its own um, and you really have to just let people kind of you know do it do their do their thing in a way and i i feel like i don't know what it's like for other institutions in the us but i feel like the donor um you know philanthropy in the us and i think that's something that we have to understand as germans and, and that we maybe don't know when we start out, but the, the kind of approach to philanthropy in the US is a completely different one to here. You know, it's, it's a country that um, basically built everything themselves. So whenever you needed a church in a village, you went to the richest guy and asked him for money. And in Germany, philanthropy, isn't, it doesn't have the same, it doesn't play the same part as it does play in the US. In the US, charity really plays a huge part in people donating money for them is it's really it's just integral part of their identity and so i you know they talk about it they're interested in it they have they have fun with it they love being donors and 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 part a part of this kind of donor family at the at the munich opera they really love it and so they talk about it to their friends and they bring more people so it's i think you really have to you have to trust a little as well in the trust in the structure and also trust um in in the kind of kind of look out that that especially you as americans i mean and the rest of europe is a little different but especially in the us this is really something that they take pride in and and i'm you know i'm happy if they want to support the bavarian state opera we've gained some really cool um cool donors who really engage and and especially i think in, you know when COVID started a lot of them got in touch and 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 really like kind of told us that they will continue supporting us and everything. So it's been a really valuable thing. So I, I really think everyone should do it. You can always stop if you don't want it to, you know, if it, it fails, then you just <laughs> stop doing it, do something else. Well, thank you very much for that. I'll pass back to King One. My experience has also been that you've got to try. I mean, yes, sometimes Absolutely. it fails, but quite often if you just try, it'll work. You yeah. just may maybe need to try try twice. Especially uh, in but, fundraising, uh, I think. In fundraising, you should always tr try twice or three yeah. times, and then you can give up if it doesn't work. So thanks exactly. for that very much, uh, giving us some encouragement, and I'll pass this back to King One for some closing remarks. From my side, thank you very much, everyone, for, for this wonderful uh, exchange. Thank Great. you. Great. Um, yeah, just a, just a brief word to just say thank you to our speakers. Thank you to the German Fundraising Association for being a wonderful partner, um, to Larissa and to Martin. Carla, thank you so much for being generous with your time. I know that it means a lot to participants to hear from somebody 
uh, a closer neighbor. <laughs> I'm just gonna I'm things. gonna put my um, email address in the chat. So if anyone has any questions, sure. you can just text me. Sorry, Go that's on. very kind. And if anyone has any additional questions for Karen too, she'd be happy to to answer those uh, separately. So just thank you so much from the King Baldwin Foundation US. Please do reach out to me if you're interested in learning more about how we can help. Martin, is there anything else that you wanted to to say before we sign off? No, just to encourage everyone to to follow up. We'll we'll send some follow up around as as we have heard from uh, King Baldwin. So there's uh, there is follow up, and we will follow up this issue, of course, um, with international fundraising, but also with fundraising in Germany and setting up new types and encouraging new types of fundraising. I think, yes, I think this is one of many elements where we can learn from each other and hopefully. Uh, give something uh, back and um, maybe uh, just to encourage King Baduan, they can do a reverse thing at some point, maybe learning from German fundraising, they can do that for the US. That could be challenging. So just as an idea. <laughs> <laughs> we love it. Thank you so much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your evening. Take care.